Hi, I'm James Knott and this is your Better Beer Authority. But actually, maybe these are the Better Beer Authorities. These are the founders of founders, Mike Stevens and Dave Engbers. Uh, you guys started this company. Um, so whose idea was it? Uh, a little bit of both, I guess. I mean, you know, we, we were both going to school together uh, in college. We were buddies. We were drinking beer. We were, got into, uh, always kind of dabbled around in the better beer scene, which was odd for college students back then. But we were both home brewing and just kind of connected that way and uh, wrote a business plan. Neither one of us really came for money, so we had, took quite a process to go find that. But Yeah, uh, we weren't really qualified for anything but. <laughs> That's but but one. drinking beer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we both worked at beer distributors and... Uh, you know, beer was one of those things that was really important in our lives, and uh, I guess at the time we were just drinkers. But uh, also, we kept, you know, everyone kept saying, do what you love, do what you love. And at the time, I think there was only one brewery, maybe two breweries in the entire state. Yeah, I mean, this yeah. is the mid-90s. I mean, this is it's kind of a bit of a stretch still to yeah. be thinking about opening a brewery, isn't it's it? Kind of, I mean, it's funny you say that we were just in a marketing meeting today, and we were kind of talking about... we're. we're it's, it's insane for us to say in 15 years we're actually kind of getting to a point where there's some reflection and we're looking back at what we mm -hmm. started and, and it was brought up about, you know, we're, we're only just beginning, which is true, but we did kind of identify and bring up that there has been kind of a close of an era, which there was, I think, the breweries of, that started, you know, 20 years ago and obviously there was what, you know, Ken Grossman and Fritz Maytag did and Larry Bell did little bit before that but you know early in the 90s and through that era has kind of gone by now and it's 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 a part that we were you know it's when we started and it's when it was more pioneering it's when it was undiscovered it was when it was unproven you yeah. know consumers weren't necessarily looking at you and and uh, you weren't experiencing big growth like we are now yeah you know, now the consumers have grabbed a hold of this industry and it's a whole different ball game but when we got into this, we, we truly got into it because we were home brewers. So we, well, you were home brewers, passion, and this it. is before the internet, I mean, oh, so yeah, you're going right. to, did you buy supplies from Larry Bell? I bought all my supplies here in town. Oh, okay. yeah. here in town. Yeah, I mean, shop up in Rockford, I yeah. remember. They're but it, was, it really was, some of the guys that Mike talked about, the, you know, the guys from Sierra and Anchor, I mean, those were the guys that were really the trailblazers. Yeah. And then Larry down, you know, an hour south of us, um, was brewing phenomenal beer. You know, I think he started brewing in 85, and when we got into it, it um, took us a little while to, to raise money and find a location, go, go through the build-out, but, I mean, we, we honestly thought, you know, we were getting into this way too late. We thought the window of opportunity had closed, and yeah. now, now we get calls from people, and they say, oh, well, you're one of the pioneers, and they're like, like really? I don't know if we're a pioneer, but, um, you know, those, Crockett. Yeah, those guys wow. were really the, the trailblazers. Put my hat on. <laughs> yeah, so you were, uh, for this year, on Rate Beer's uh, list of top breweries. You were number two in the world. We were almost number one. Right. Almost number one? <laughs> we, we both got shirts. We almost made it. <laughs> I mean, does, when you started getting that acclaim, did that change the business? I don't think it changed the business. It's, no. it's, it's really a nice, uh, I guess, a nice acknowledgement of where, we, where we've come from. Um, or come to, but you know, th there's great beer being brewed all over the world. And, you know, and it's it's nothing to take away from rate beer. I mean, they've done a. It's great that we've got these enthusiasts that are really engaged in our industry. But um, you know, I'm amazed that you know I get to travel on behalf of the company, and there's great beer coming out all over the place. I mean, what do you think it is about your brewery that seems to be getting all these beer geeks geeked up? I mean. I there's a lot, uh, like over 1,700 breweries right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're in a fortunate position where I think founders, w what we've done is we've managed to create a brewery that has depth in brands. We don't hang our hat on any one style. Yeah. And you don't know founders because of that one beer or right. that second beer. Yeah. We yeah. don't really, we don't have a dominant brand. And the depth of field that we have, and the, what our brewers are doing, it just it pays you know, tribute to what they're doing out there. I mean, we, we represent a brewery that has 15 products, all of which any one of us as consumers can confidently know we can go to the shelf, 
grab one and go, oh, yeah, it's Founders, it's going to be pretty damn good. Yeah. And we, we can hang <coughs> our hat on that. Not, not always does every brewery have that opportunity because usually you're kind of chasing after one or two brands that you have in your family. So you have, uh, you guys are number two. Mm -hmm. Bell's on this list was number three. Yeah. Three Floyds is number one. Yeah. I mean, these are relatively close geographically. Uh, yeah. Dark Horse was also number 26. Or at, so is, there, is it just coincidence that you guys are so close, uh, or is there something in the water? The thing that I always think about when, when people talk <laughs> about that, the water. <laughs> um, I think the water might have something to do with it. But I, I think part of it is um, you know, we're, we're very good friends with all those breweries. Um, where, I mean, the guys from Bell's were up here not just a couple of weeks ago. The guys from Floyd's have been up here real recently. Um, but I, I think part of it is the fact, you know, Larry started, he got a 10-year head start on all of us. Mm -hmm. And Larry makes really, really great beer. And that really makes us, as a player in this industry, to elevate your game. We drank a bunch of that great beer last yeah. night. Yeah. <laughs> no, he, I, I hope mean, you're feeling okay. Dave's right. I mean, what it is is when you have somebody that's kind of, been uh, one of the founding fathers of the industry uh -huh. 45 minutes away from you. When you come out and start a brewery, you better damn well come out with something at least as good, if not better, yeah. than what, the, and, and that's all we knew. That's the world we lived in. We didn't start a brewery and look at, you know, brewery X across the street that is just mediocre. We were looking at brewery X across the street that was really, really damn good at yeah. what they do. So that bar has always been higher for, I think, Michigan brewers and Midwestern brewers as, you know, as well. And I think because it's the weather, I don't know, because we're fat and lazy, whatever what you want to say, it's we, were we enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> whatever they say of the Midwestern folk, I mean, we enjoy a lot of flavor and a lot of meat on our bones and a lot of this and that. And I, that comes through in the beer. Yeah. Know? I think we the fact that we're, we're Midwestern and I mean, we've, we've, we're not on the East Coast, we're not on the West Coast, we do it our own way and it takes us a little while, you know, to, to see trends in, in industries, but when we do it, we do it right. When you guys first started, were you guys the ones shoveling the grain and all that stuff? When we started, I mean, there's we're three of on. us. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, at, at the early All days, the bartended the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. So we used to we used to build bottling, build so every cool. six pack, build every mother case. We used to listen to a lot of the Almond Brothers and the white and the white album. I remember, because <laughs> I mean, building the packaging took up a lot of time, and then yeah. one of us would go out and sell. One of us would help brew and package. Yeah. And then, was, like Mike said, and now you're just eating bonbons. Oh my God. <laughs> we don't do a damn thing now. No, we just sit a lot around. of a lot of yacht trips. <laughs> <laughs> like with my second yacht. <laughs> <laughs> I got to clean that thing all the time. Uh, so you just came out with a new product, All Day IPA. Yeah. Uh, it's 4.7% ABV. Correct. Um, so is this inspired brewing, or is this just a way to fill a need in the market? Completely inspired brewing, 100%. It was our largest challenge, I'd say, to date in our 15-year history. We've spent three years constructing this beer. And the, the challenge was set out, um, you know, essentially to make, a, to make a beer, a good social beer, an active beer that uh, contributes to our lifestyles. You know, we like mm -hmm. the outdoors, camping, riding mountain bikes, doing whatever. Um, but wasn't a, but had, still had the full flavor that a founder's beer carries. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to just create a dummy down session beer. Yeah. yeah, and that was our inspiration. If it's going to be a dummy down session beer, then we're not touching it. Yeah. And there were people coming out with session beers, and we would try them, and we thought this is the joke. It's just a little bit revved up over a domestic beer. Yeah. And our goal was to be the opposite of that. And through three years, I think we we we've hit it. We've hit it hard. And the beer is phenomenal. It has a bit of Red's Rye esque kind of flavor to uh -huh. it. But it does carry 4.7 percent, so you can drink it all day. That was a, a huge challenge oh, wait, for us. Name. What? <laughs> <laughs> it is a catchy name. It is a very catchy name. Um, but th yeah, that was the biggest challenge. I mean, we're trying to find something that had all the characteristics of a typical founder's beer, yet something that you know, if you drank three or four of them, you could still function and be a responsible parent, and still, you know, if you go out and right. get off the trail, it's thirst quenching, but you know, you can still go out and have fun. 
I'd say yeah. this beer probably more than any beer we've produced. I mean, we've nurtured along like it's a child because we've watched it grow up. We've we we started. The, it's gone through different names in the tap room over the three years. I mean, we started. Mm -hmm. It was solid, solid gold. gold. It was super, super gold. gold, and then it was endurance, <laughs> and then it, we just kept changing because our only playground, our only testing ground, is the tap room. Right. And we didn't want to kind of you know indicate to people that we were experimenting with a beer that was going to be in package, even though we knew that was our end goal right. three years ago. Yeah. So we would always come out with a different name for a little different version of this thing, and we would tweak it and tweak it, and we just watched the evolution of this whole thing take place, and uh, it ended up with All Day, and it's a phenomenal, phenomenal beer. I think it's one of the best we've done. It's yeah. crushable. Crushable? It's <laughs> crushable. <laughs> That's the word we use. <laughs> so still, I think, I, I mean, I was, what were you when we started the brewery? Eight? I think I was 25, you were probably 22, uh, three. Yeah, 23. You yeah. know, so I'm, I mean, I'm 44 now, and it, the crushable thing kind of becomes a problem after yeah. a while when you're drinking 8% beer. So. Yes, it's very much <laughs> <well, it's, laughs> <laughs> But now we're, this but, is great to have. <laughs> but now you're refined and I don't know if we're people. refined, but, <laughs> but I, I think it's, I think it's a great beer for where we are in the industry, because um, this isn't, like yeah, Mike said, this isn't just a dummy down beer. Right. The thing that I think is really interesting is other, you know, other breweries are coming over to us and saying, "Oh, it's perfect! It's a, it's the perfect beer. It's what we've all been waiting for." Because it's, right. it's a beer that's got a ton of flavor, but it's not the most bitter beer. It's not the maltiest beer. It's not the the highest ABV. You know, it seems like everyone wanted What's to hit. What's the recipe? Oh, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, but that, I mean, that was a big thing. Copy. Everyone was kind of hitting all these big peaks. You know, you had to be, you had to distinguish yourself about something. And now it's like, no, this is just a fantastic drinkable beer. Is this gonna, it, do you think there's gonna be a flood of session IPAs? Uh, you know, to, I think people are already <laughs> doing that. Um, I know of three coming out in the next two months here right. in the oh, state. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely is happening. But it, the, the cool right. thing too to me, and it, it, you know, when you, think about it is it's kind of we always joke and you know make fun of the big domestics and stuff and um, I don't particularly care for their their flavor of beers but it's kind of a, I mean this proves that you you can make a good a good flavored full beer that isn't you know doesn't carry all that heavy balance and everything it's just I don't know to us it was like a challenge that I thought that we really excelled at and yeah our brewers did a phenomenal job with it now behind us, we have some the packaging and line going on. So the brewery is right behind us. I mean, seems like yeah. a pretty big room. Do you guys feel like a big brewery now? Bigger uh, than we were five years ago. <laughs> <than> we <laughs> you just expanded. Uh, we did. Correct me if I'm wrong. What fifty thousand barrels per year? You could we do? did uh, four years ago. I mean, just a little over four years ago, we were doing five thousand barrels, and right now we're brewing on pace for about eighty-five thousand. Wow, that's a huge so, jump. I mean, yeah, it's changed quite a bit. So, you know, at what point does that growth become unmanageable? I mean, do you worry about that or do you just go for it? I don't, I don't think it's unmanageable. Yeah. What's, what's been really cool is, like Mike said, you know, five years ago we were doing uh, 5,000 barrels and there was 15 of us. Right. Now I think there's uh, as of 108 with oh, uh, someone else. Uh, so 108 strong. Welcome, Steve. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean that. I mean that. That really, I think, is going to be one of the bigger challenges. Is as the team is getting bigger, it's getting bigger, but it's getting stronger, and um, maintaining the culture of of who we are and what we do. And it's amazing. I mean, just like the beer industry itself, all these beer enthusiasts are super passionate about mm -hmm. about what they do, and so. Um, you know what we're doing is just brewing more beer, and we're not we're not getting bigger because there's some end goal. It's getting pulled from our wholesalers and and from the consumers, the the demand. Right, I, and that's a big thing. What Dave said is it's not about the volume that we're producing. I mean, for us, it's always been and always will be about the beer. Mm -hmm. I mean, we started as home brewers. That's what we love we would stop this game at 10,000 barrels if it, if, if, if it had to affect the integrity of the beer. And that's the thing we've always ha hung on to. And I, you know, if you can make 100,000 barrels of beer 
and, and keep that integrity, or if it's, I don't care, a million, 10 million. Yeah. That's, not the, that's not the result we're after. The result we're after is, you know, when people do say, holy cow, you, you guys are ranked number two? Right. You know, or you that have three beers in the top 10? Or, you know, just all of that. We're winning, you know, we go to the GABF and the World Beer Cup a couple of years ago, we won six awards in six different beers. You know, mm -hmm. and that's the depth and stuff that I speak to. And I mean, it's just, it's phenomenal what this whole group has done. It's not Dave and I, it's not any one individual that started founders and created founders and has been the driving force behind it. We just managed to start hiring the cool people. Uh, yeah. All these cool people came together and make a kick-ass beer. You know, the people now that, are, that we're hiring are getting on board and they're excited about it. Yeah. But they show the same passion for, for beer as we do. When, one beer that causes a big stir is KBS. It Which does? one? <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, I think you're tripling the amount that you're making. Yeah, uh, Roughly. I mean, it's don't completely hold us to that. <laughs> but no, we do have. It's oh God, we, we put it in a couple I press know, releases. I know, I know. No, we will. That. I mean, it, um, I'm only I mean, as accurate simple as math. the internet. Well, it's been, it's, it's it's, been brewed. It's simple math. The, the reality is, is you, you know, you. That, Why not do ten times more? I mean, well, if there's it, that many people this, that well, want. This is the simple math theory. What essentially what we have to do is our limitation is it's attached directly to the brew house size that we have. Yeah. So what we do when we make Kentucky breakfast is we stop all that we do 24 seven, one week a year and make as much Kentucky breakfast as we can. And then that goes into a, you know, the bourbon barrels and it's aged for a year. Mm -hmm. um, so Kentucky breakfast is not a product that you can make you know, throughout a course of four months. Yeah. And, and, and then age it because we want that, pro we have a very specific process that we take in producing that beer and it is to put it all into the caves at the same time so right. it ages similarly. But, and it's, it's not just that too, it's also we have a responsibility to the rest of our lineup to maintain right. that Centennial IPA yeah. and Dirty Bastard and Red's Rye and well, that's our the other brands. The, the we, have to keep, we, I mean, we have yeah. to keep producing those brands so the shelves don't dry up. Well, you got supply and demand, so if there's that many people demanding it, then you could just raise the price up really high and that would kind of yeah, no, shorten the lines, not, right? That's not <laughs> the style either. The whole idea has to be, you know, our beer should always be accessible. Accessible. Yeah. You know, and that's one yeah. of our frustrations when, you know. Does that piss thing, you off if it ends oh, up on eBay yeah. or something? Yeah. Oh. yeah. It's ridiculous. But the thing is, we can't control that. And that's, that's one of the frustrations from a brewing standpoint is, you know, once it leaves our dock, we have almost zero control over it. Yeah, so when right. we see retailers um, that are gouging, when, when I mm -hmm. see somebody selling a bottle for $25, you know, that, that retailer is taking full advantage of the market. Yeah. And, you know, our, and our, um, our direction to our wholesalers is the next specialty beer that's released, that, that retailer shouldn't get any. Yeah. You know, our beer, yeah. we price our beer um, where, you know, we can make a little bit of money, our wholesaler makes a little money, but we want it to be accessible to the masses. You should price it so you make a lot of money. No. <laughs> we, we want to make it accessible. I mean, I've never been in business school. But, <laughs> no. We didn't get into this business to yeah. make money. No, that's awesome. Uh, so earlier, you mentioned Synergy. And speaking of Synergy, you have a collaboration with Green Flash coming mm -hmm. out. And, you know, there's some people, kind of the, the beer nerds, who kind of just look at it as kind of like cynical, like it's mm -hmm. just a marketing thing. I mean, is there a so reason? So do we, actually. Uh, is that what Absolutely. it is? This is the first collab we've ever done, and I will, I'm just saying this, but I bet I'll, I'll say we probably won't do many more. Yeah. We, not because this wasn't a great experience, but there's very few breweries that we would want to do it yeah. with. Yeah. Green Flash is one of them. <laughs> I can count on my hand. I mean, it was, we probably will do, you know, in the future a few others, but we will not never be a collab happy brewery. No, never. No. This, this really, this came about. I was, uh, I was actually in Cleveland, and I met one of the guys from Green Flash, and um, they're nice people. I love, I love a lot of their beers, and uh, he he asked me if we'd ever consider doing a collaboration, and I said, you know, we've never done one, and we've always shied away, and he said, you know, we've done a couple, and. Neither one of us had I mean, a hard you could have, it. I mean, it's Lynchpin White IPA. You could have just made a White IPA on your own, right? Sure. You don't need right. 
other no, people that will come to the brewery or go to their brewery. And, you know, I think this right. was really kind of a this was kind of a fun project to to test out, and we're going to be uh, you know we're going to launch it next week at the Craft Brewers Conference, mm -hmm. and this was just kind of a fun experiment. And like Mike said, we're not going to be uh, collaboration happy. I mean, we've probably turned down over fifty. Yeah. Um, but the yeah. the time was right on this one. We're going to we're going to test the waters a little bit. There there are a handful of breweries that we'd like to work with because we are we're friendly with a lot of breweries. So is there the all the success that comes around here? You've also had some failures, I'm sure. But has Come that ever on. put a, a strain on your relationship? <laughs> Ours? Yeah. No, I, I mean, we've, we're, I think, a fortunate partnership in that what he's good at, I'm not, and what I'm good at, he's not. Mm. He's and very organized. It's yeah. just, uh, <laughs> and he's very disorganized. So. <laughs> but I'm very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing I, w I was wondering, though, is uh, on, your, on your website, it mentions how at one point you were kind of making just balanced session beers and you're heading towards bankruptcy. I mean, right. were you was it getting really dire or what was the oh, yeah, what was the turning point? I don't think you really mentioned that on there. The, well, I mean, the turning point was I mean, we were literally days away from having a court case with our bank and our landlord. Yeah. Mm. And it got to the point where, you know, I think, you know, Mike tells a story about, you know, getting a call from the bank saying if we don't get a check for, you know, it's a six-figure check by Tuesday, we're putting chains on your doors, and uh, I mean that's mm -hmm. the that's when you have the come to Jesus meeting. You know, is do we want to keep doing this? You uh -huh. know, do you want to keep bleeding or? Right. And you know, it, it really boiled down to. I mean, it wasn't that sales were really lousy. It was that we created this huge train wreck behind us, and our business model didn't work. Mm. And um, but we both felt that we had like kind of one last chance to go for it, and it's right. Right as uh, Dirty Bastard was invented. And so is that uh, kind of like the turning point, Dirty Bastard? Yeah, I, I would say, say that's yeah. the beer that kind of saved us. I mean, we, <coughs> I mean, when we got that phone call, we weren't. I mean, we were a tiny, tiny company. I mean, we, yes, yeah, sales were growing, but you know, we we borrowed a million dollars and started with zero cases sold. So we had a long ways to go mm -hmm. to get up to that break even point. In fact, it was ended up taking us 10, 11 years to get there. Yeah. So we bled profusely for years and years. And in particular, those first five years is when we were trying to discover, you know, who the hell who we, we are, were, and yeah. what we were going to do, mission. what's our beer, and this and that. And bankruptcy, I think, kind of puts a gun to your head and makes you realize that I got to figure this out pretty quick. So Dave and I were sitting there and we were frustrated. And we, you, you, almost, you start getting mad and pissed off, and it just turned into, you know what, screw this. I mean, if we're going down, let's start making beers <laughs> that we, you know, that we want to drink. The beers that, that really got us into this anyways, which were always heavier, bigger beers, and more full of character and flavor. So more flavor, less that, crush factor? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, no, actually, we wanted, we, wanted, to make well, we, wanted, crush factor. we wanted flavor and complexity. I mean, the, the reality was when we opened up is during the first flood of the, the microbrew explosion in yeah. the mid-90s. And every brewery that opened had pale I mean, ales. Same beer. Yeah, it was just pale, pale ales, wheat, amber ales, amber. wheats, some either a porter or a stout. Yeah. So we're all kind of cookie cutter. And I mean, essentially, we went to, um, we were looking at beer styles, and we were like, all right, here's a style of beer that's not popular, and no one's doing it. Mm -hmm. So we decided to come out with a Scotch Ale and. And a Dirty Bastard and Piss People Off. And, yeah, it just, yeah, the name just got <laughs> banned in Alabama. Wait, Alabama, Alabama doesn't want to put it out there. Someday, so Alabama. We're working on it. Screw Alabama. We're working on it. No, no, no. <laughs> Let me tell you right now, good people of Alabama. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> I'll come down and visit you, and I'll drink a dirty bastard with you. <laughs> Such a bad word. <laughs> right. Well, okay. Final question. Final question. This came up with like five new beer names. Right. <laughs> Look into the future. What is the future of Founders? Keep making great beer. Yeah. I mean, I mean that's just... stay stay really. Uh, you know, I would say the future of Founders is don't change. Stay true. Stay, to, stay, stay true to who we are. Never. We'll, I mean, I mean, our commitment is we'll never compromise a, a product. We're not going to sell out. We're not going to do any. We're not going to 
compromise a, a recipe to make more. We're not going to change our process to make more. Mm -hmm. We're going to continue to grow, stay stay the course, and uh, but we will continue to grow. I mean, we've got there are a lot of great beer enthusiasts out there, and we've got a responsibility to get the beer in their hands. Okay, last chance. What's the recipe for all day IPA? Fuck that. <laughs> Okay. We don't even know. <laughs> we are, uh, that's it here from Founders Brewing Company in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, we have Mike Stevens and Lord Engbers. Uh, I'm going to get you a damn We're saying, saying good night to the brewery in the background. <laughs> Sparkles is on there throwing the lights. <laughs> and I'm James Knott, and this has been a very fun episode of the Better Beer Authority. Better beer with Overhead, better beer with Overhead, better beer with